Hi all, my name is Sammy and I am here from Avid CNC. Today I'm going to walk you through an introduction to CNC project. This is a really great place to start if you are new to CNC. In part one, I will walk you through the CAD and CAM in VCarve and we'll be designing this very simple tool tray which holds your wrenches, your collets, router bits, and a few extra tools that are really handy to have near the CNC machine. We'll also learn how to program two basic types of toolpaths, our pocket and profile toolpath. And then in part two, I will show you how to set up and run your part on the CNC machine. We'll do some basic work holding, learn how to turn on a home and zero our CNC. And we'll also include a full walkthrough of Mach 4 so you really feel confident in that workflow. All right, I hope you enjoy this project. If you have ideas for other projects you'd like to learn how to make or other workflows you're interested in, let us know in the comments below. And uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into it. Let's go ahead and jump into vCarve. I'm going to open up vCarve Pro. If you're using Aspire or desktop, this should work just fine for you as well. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and make a new file. Go to create a new file. And here is where you will enter in your material dimensions. I like to take measuring tape and make sure that the material I'm going to be using is the material dimensions I enter here. So I'm going to select a single sided job and enter in my material dimensions, which is 24 inches by eight inches. And that's going to be three quarters of an inch thick. So I'll go ahead and put 0.25. If you're using metric units, you can go ahead and select millimeters instead of inches. I'm using imperial, so I'll go ahead and use uh, inches here. Now we'll select our Z0 position. So this is going to be the material that we're going to be referencing off of with our touch plate. And I'm going to select the material surface. You can also select the machine bed, and you can see how that dot moves up and down. We'll use material surface. There are several reasons to select uh, the material surface or the machine bed. We can review why you might select one over the other in a deep dive when we go into CNC zeroing in the future. Uh, but for now, let's just select material surface. It's a really easy uh, corner to use. And I'm going to select the front left corner. So the front left and material surface. Uh, that will work really well with our touch plate and our Mach 4 interface. I'm going to make sure to unselect use offset here. Great, so I'm going to go ahead and click OK to open up my design. Let me just give you a quick tour of the layout of vCarve. So on the left side, I have my 2D drawing operations. So here is how I can create vectors, uh, transform those, objects and edit those objects. I also have a couple tabs down here, uh, modeling, clip art, and layers. So I will be using the layers tab fairly often, as well as the drawing tab. And then on the right side here, I have a little tab where I can open up the toolpaths tab. And we'll be using this to generate our cam or our toolpaths. So we'll get back to that in a little bit. And we're going to start out with our vector uh, drawing. Uh, on the top here, you can reorient uh, your different view choices. Um, so go ahead and click through and explore those to kind of see how it affects the layout and visibility of your drawing. Okay, so first let's create the exterior boundary of our tool tray. In the Create Vectors tab here, I can go ahead and select uh, Draw Circle, Ellipse, Rectangle. I'll use Draw Rectangle. And here I can enter in the anchor points uh, that I would like my vector to be on, or I can simply click and drag that vector as well. Here I can go ahead and enter in those dimensions. So height, let's say uh, four and a half, width is 18 inches. And you can also say the anchor point. So where is the bottom left corner? What are those coordinates? So here you can see if I hit apply, uh, we still have plenty of room so I can make this larger, make this six inches, and uh, we'll just try to center this object. So we can, we know that it's 24 inches wide, so if we make it 12 on center, 
and then at four inches on center to divide eight is inches is the height and 24 inches is the width. So if we hit apply, make this six inches tall, uh, we kind of have a far more uh, useful size here. So I have one vector and I'm immediately drawing on the uh, layer one. So I can go up to layer one and just rename this exterior profile uh, through cut. So it's really good to come up with a clear naming convention for your layers, for your tool paths, and uh, for your G-code. So when you export your G-code, you want to make sure that's a really clear uh, file naming convention. So we'll just say OK, Enter to rename that. You can also change the color of that layer. So I can just change that to um, a light green and go back to my drawing tab. So now I'm going to go ahead and draw a few more vectors for the different shapes that I'd like to cut out. The way I'm going to organize them is by cut depth. So there are going to be some vectors I'd like to cut half an inch deep, some three eighths of an inch deep, some of a quarter inch deep. Um, so putting them on different layers will help us organize our toolpaths later on. So the first vector layer I'm going to add in addition to this exterior profile is an offset line. So that's really going to give me a guide so I have an even border all the way around my tool tray. So I'll select this vector, right click, and copy to layer. But I'll copy this to a new layer and I'll call this reference. And so I'll just make it orange for you for right now. I have that vector selected and I'm going to offset this vector inward. I'm going to offset that half an inch. You can enter in these different dimensions if you like. I'm going to delete that original line and offset. So I have this vector selected. I'm going to go to my Layers tab. I have it move to my Reference layer, turn off my exterior profile layer, so all I can see is the orange. And if I want to do any work on a particular layer, I have to make sure that that is bold and highlighted. So I'll select, make sure that I'm on my Reference layer, select my vector, and go back to my Drawing tab. Here is where I'm going to make an offset of that vector. Down on the bottom, I have the Offset and Layout uh, icons here, so we'll select Offset, and we'll do an inward offset and half inch. Go ahead and offset that, and now we have a vector that's offset inward, which will give us a, a nice box to snap our guides to. Okay, so for layers, we can turn on our exterior profile again if we like, and I'll create a new layer. This is going to be our pocket. 0.5 inches deep. So I like to enter in the name of my layer and indicating how deep I would like that pocket to be cut. Enter and make sure that that is selected. I'll go back to my drawing tab and create a few vectors here. So I will click and drag my vector. This is going to be the initial pocket for the wrenches here. So we can make this whatever dimension you like. I measured it to be, I believe, 11 inches by 4 inches as being a, a good uh, dimension here. 11 by 4 until you're happy with that dimension layout. Uh, I'll make that 11 by 3.5 for now. And you can always make these adjustments later on as you go. And I will put the dimensions that I'm referencing up here above. Now I'd like to make my circles for the collets. And those are going to be 1 and 3 eighths inch in diameter. And I'll just go ahead and click a few of those. I'll place one of them. That sounds good. We'll do that. Uh, so now I can go ahead and move that and snap it to my reference layer. So you can see here it is snapped to my reference so that it's just nicely lined up. I can see that my wrench box here is a little bit uh, close to my collet uh, nut holder. So I think that I'm going to make this one a little bit smaller and I can 
scale from any corner. I'll make this 3.25. That seems to kind of give it a little bit more breathing room. So once I have a, a few shapes here, I can also um, do a few things like copy and paste them. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to select the vector that I'd like to have copies of, especially if I want them in a set distance or spacing. I will select the vector and I will go to my array copy. Here I can set the number of rows and the number of columns. So I want one row and I'll have three copies of the uh, circular pocket for the call it and call it nut. And here I can indicate the gap that I would like it to be on the X and Y axis. I'll go ahead and enter in half an inch as the gap for the X axis. The Y axis doesn't matter because we're only making copies in the X direction. You can either set a gap or an offset. Uh, we'll do the gap, the spacing between the vectors and go ahead and copy. So now I have three evenly placed circles uh, that are on the half inch uh, pocket depth layer. Super, so now I want to make a few uh, more shapes that are going to be for my half inch uh, router bits and my quarter inch router bits. Let's go to the layers tab and just create a few more layers. Pocket, 0 0.375 inches deep. And we can make these different colors as well if that helps you kind of visualize. Pocket, 0 0.02 inches deep. Super. So I'll change that color as well, make that plum. So now I have the pocket 3 8 inch deep layer selected and go back to my drawing tab. So I'm going to make two pockets for the half inch bits to go. I will select my rectangle and go ahead and uh, draw a few rectangles here. I want that to be just over a half inch width so that the router bit fits comfortably. I'll make that 0.55 inches by 4.5 inches tall. And then I can hit close and just snap that to my guide there. Lovely. And I can make a few copies this way as well using the array. Uh, this time, because I want it to copy to the left, I'll use a negative 0.25 inches to copy that. We'll make that two columns and copy. So now I have two of that version. I also think I'd like these call it and call it net holders to go on the 3 8 inch layer as well. I created them on the half inch layer, but I can just select them, right click, and go to move to layer. Here I can select any layer I'd prefer them to be on and set them to the 3 8 inch layer. So now you can see their color has changed to blue instead of black. So now I'll select another rectangle drawing tool, but this time I'm going to go back to the half inch deep layer. And now I'm going to make a rectangle here that is at the bottom of this taller shape for the half inch bit to sit in. So this pocket will be slightly deeper, uh, but will allow you to press down on the shaft of the router bit so it can kind of pop up and it's easier to remove. And we'll make this the same width and we'll make this one inch tall and hit apply. And now I'll just snap that down. Uh, align with the larger box. And I can array copy this again. The same settings should be saved already from when I copied the two tall blue boxes and copy that. So now I have two of those shapes on that layer as well. And we'll close. So let's make a few that are for the quarter inch bits. I'll go to the pocket point Oh, I, re I misnamed this, 0 0.2 inches deep. Just so that the uh, router bits are a little bit raised above the height of the tool tray, but uh, won't go anywhere. We'll make a rectangle here. And uh, the router bits that I'm using are about uh, two and a half inches tall, but I think I'll make those 
2.75 inches uh, so that they have a little bit of room to, if I have taller bits or shorter bits, and I'll make the width 0.3 inches and hit apply. At this point, I can make sure that it's a specific gap from the half inch bits if I'd like to uh, by drawing on the reference layer, uh, but I'm fine with those now. So I'll go ahead and make a few copies of this. We'll do array copy and we'll leave these dimensions as is, except for that I will add in a few more columns. So I'll make that six and copy. So I have several uh, spaces for quarter inch bits to go there. I'm gonna switch back to the 3 8 inch deep layer so then I can add a few of those kind of pop-up pockets on the bottom. And we'll go ahead and draw those. I'll make that about an inch tall and the same width as the quarter inch uh, bit pocket and hit apply. We'll zoom in just to make sure I can snap that to my vector. So you can see here, all we're doing is drawing it rectangles and circles, and then we'll be able to tell the machine, okay, here is the box cut inside of that box to this specific depth. Um, it's kind of a combination of of what you call 2D or 2.5D in this case. You have a 2D vector and the CAM or the computer aided machining determines the 3D dimensionality of it. So you say cut to this depth within this 2D vector, 2.5D. Okay, so now I'm going to array this again, array copy and copy. So now I have those uh, pasted and I want to just ensure that those are on the three eighths inch deep pocket layer, which it looks like they are. So this allows me to make this box a little bit longer. And I can add a few more detail layers as well. We'll make a, an additional uh, rectangle here for some pencils and uh, writing utensils. And I'll make one more over here for some additional hardware. I like to just keep a little dish of, you know, for V-bits v or screws or something like that, just to have that kind of accessible. Awesome, so now we have all of our vectors drawn. We can go ahead to our Layers tab and hide our reference layer. And so now you can see we have all of our shapes ready. Well, we'll go to our Toolpath layer now and pin that. And we can unpin on the left side our 2D drawing tab so that we have more room for our visibility of the material. So now that we have our layout all ready for our cam, uh, let's jump into our toolpaths over here. There are many kinds of toolpaths. We're gonna stick to two basic toolpaths today and that would be profile toolpath and pocket toolpath. So first let's make our profile toolpath which in this case will actually be the very last toolpath to run, um, but it is a very common toolpath. So let's just go through that one first. We'll open up our 2D profile toolpath. And here it gives us many options in which to enter in which bit we would like to select, how we would like to cut this toolpath. I'd encourage you to turn on show advanced toolpath options here. And that uh, will give you a few more options. I don't think it is that overwhelming, you know, so just read through them and take your time. Here we have our tool selection and mill. I can click select here and it will open up my toolpath database. I've also linked in the description below a tool database walkthrough from Vectra. Um, so that's a really great place to reference uh, for how you might edit and add to this. If you go down here, you can add your own tools. Uh, today I'm gonna to be using a quarter inch end mill for my cutting, and I'm going to only use one tool so we don't have to perform a manual tool change. I'll set my inches. Uh, it's a quarter inch diameter tool, has two flutes. Uh, I set my path depth to an eighth inch, which is half the diameter of the tool. So uh, generally, a good starting point for cutting uh, wood products like plywood or MDF, um, 
half of the diameter or the radius of the tool is a good place for your pass depth to start. Uh, your step over is 40%. And you can kind of think about that as mowing your lawn. So when you overlap your previous toolpath, when you're going back and forth to mow your lawn, you're not perfectly aligning. You're overlapping your previous pass that you made so that there's a, a really clean pattern. Our spindle speed is 18,000 RPM and our feed units are set in inches per minute. Here our feed rate is 200 inches per minute. I uh, might bump this up to as much as 350 for this project, uh, but 200 is a, you know, a good place to start if you're feeling a little bit nervous about a machine cutting pretty quickly. Our plunge rate is 80 inches per minute, so that's how fast it will move uh, when doing a plunge move. And we'll go ahead and select this tool. If you'd like to edit the settings for the tool within the toolpath, and not changing the settings within the tool database, you can always click on edit here, and this will bring up the same settings. And if you make changes here, um, it only changes within this toolpath rather than changing the whole library. Great, so now we're gonna select which side of the vector we'd like to cut on. And we're gonna cut on the outside, uh, but you can also select to cut on the inside of the vector or on the line. Uh, in that case, you want to make sure to compensate for the diameter of the bit, and that will really um, affect what your outcome is. So we'll cut on the outside. And let's go ahead and move down to the bottom here to vector selection. It's currently set to manual, so I can click on the vector and select that, or I can click on selector and associate with toolpath. It'll bring us this pop-up and we want to select the exterior profile through cut. So I will select that vector layer and deselect anything else. So now it's going to select the outside profile and we'll close. So now you can see that that vector has been selected. Uh, now that the vector has been selected, we can go back up to a few of the other options. We'll add tabs. So tabs are these little bridges that hold your part to your drop material. You can set the length and the thickness of the tab. I really prefer 3D tabs uh, because it's a lot easier to trim and to cut the tab and clean them up later on. Uh, one thing to note is that if your grain direction is left to right, uh, the tabs that are going parallel with the grain, so if they're on this side and the grain is going this direction. That means the tab will be really strong because it will be going with the grain and it's really taking advantage of that long grain. If we place them perpendicular, they won't be as strong, but they will be a lot easier to clean up because when you cut the tab, it will cut on the grain and separate. Uh, so if you choose to put them with the grain, be very careful as you remove them as they can really tear out later on. So there's really pros and cons on either uh, selection. If you're using a, a less uh, lower quality plywood, something with a lot of voids in it, I would recommend making thicker tabs or square tabs because sometimes when that tab overlaps with a void in your material, it will cause a really weak tab to be made. And let's go ahead and add a few ramps here. So we'll select ramp. Uh, I prefer the smooth setting, but there's zigzag and spiral as well. Um, spiral will just continually ramp down. Smooth, you can set the distance in which you'd like that ramp to be. I just have it set to two inches. And that really allows the router bit to ease down into the toolpath rather than plunging straight down and then moving laterally. This will really help with the life of your cutter and the quality of the cut. Here I can go ahead and now I can name the toolpath. So I have, it already says profile, and I'll say, I'll make this say exterior profile, 0 0.25 down. You can put the router bit type, the cut depth, uh, whatever you might think is useful for referencing later on. Um, this is just for a quick visual reference. Um, but really helps me stay organized. So be sure to use proper file naming convention. And we'll calculate. Oh, so we didn't actually place those tabs. So let's go ahead and do those. 
here is our preview. But before I show you that, let's go back into, I'll double click on my toolpath and edit tabs. And that brings me back to the 2D vector area. You can add tabs automatically by selecting a, a constant number of tabs, uh, a set distance. Um, I prefer to just manually add my own tabs. So I'll click and just place those tabs. I'll just place four uh, that are perpendicular to the grain. I'll close out of that and calculate. So now you can see the difference here where the uh, machine will lift up here for that triangular tab. Let's preview that visible toolpath. And you can see how it cuts that shape. And there are little tabs and our exterior to profile toolpath. So that's going to be the last toolpath that we cut because we want to do all of the pockets and the details first and then cut the shape out. Uh, I just think that Profile Toolpath will really show um, many of the details you will want to uh, look into later on. Let's go back to the 2D view and we'll make a few pocket toolpaths. So here is the pocket toolpath. And I will go ahead and let the start depth be zero and our cut depth be half inch. So we're going to need a couple toolpaths for pockets, one for half inch, uh, one for three eighths and one for uh, 0.2 inches. And we're going to let it be the same, uh, just leave the same tool selected here so that we don't have to perform a manual tool change. And now we can select the way in which the router bit will optimize its pocket. So the pocket is going to be removing material within the interior of a shape. So a pocketing toolpath will say, here's my box, I'm gonna cut inside of the box uh, to this depth. So we can select um, offset, which will do kind of a spiral shape, or raster, which is more of a left to right shape. Uh, I like raster for things that are rectangular, and I like offset for something that's uh, not rectangular. The thing to be aware of is that raster will indicate a an angle at which to uh, go back and forth, left to right. So if I uh, would like to machine this uh, rectangle with raster, I'd like it to go up and down rather than left to right because if I was mowing along this way, I'd have a lot more turns to do than if I was going up and down. So in this case, uh, offset might be a little bit more optimized for a rectangle that is a little bit elongated. So we'll just leave it offset for now. We also like to ramp plunge moves here. We'll make that one or two inches, you know, just so we can ease the router bit in to the cut. And I will go ahead and name this pocket 0 0.5 inches deep. Now we can go ahead and click our selector and we're going to associate uh, these vectors with our toolpath. We're only going to select the closed vectors on those layers and select the half inch deep po pocket and calculate that. So any of the vectors that were on that layer, uh, let's go ahead and preview that. So now there is our two pockets that were half inch deep. Let's go ahead and make a few more. We'll change this to 0.375 inches. And the nice thing is that once you've made a pocket toolpath or a toolpath of a certain type, if you make another one of that same type, it'll remember your settings from the last uh, toolpath that you created. And we'll just change this to our 3 eighths inch deep layer and name this pocket 0 0.375 inches deep and calculate. Preview that toolpath. Lovely. So you can see here, this is where the half inch router bits will sit. A uh, little pop up uh, area is. Go back to our 2D view and create another toolpath. This time, this is going to be 0.2 inches deep. 
we'll use the same tool and the offset. Call this pocket 0 0.2 inches and select the 0.2 inches deep layer. Associate that with the toolpath. Perfect, and now we can calculate and preview that visible toolpath. There we go. So we have all of our toolpaths programmed. So now at this point, I'd like to order them in the uh, order that I'd like them to run. So I'm gonna move the shallowest to the top, 0.2 inches deep. You can use these arrows to rearrange them. And I'll make sure that the exterior profile uh, is on the bottom. It will uh, run in the order in which they are listed here. So now you can go to the summary of your toolpaths to see how long it will estimate to run. And now if we go to the floppy disk save icon here, um, I love how modern that is, uh, we'll save our toolpaths. So let's save all of the visible toolpaths to one file. And I'm going to have all of these toolpaths selected. Let's select the Avid CNC inches uh, post processor. If you used metric, I used millimeter. Uh, here are a few that are for the rotary. Um, if you would like to and haven't recently, I encourage you to update your Avid CNC post processor for Vectric. Um, I have a video on that process listed in the description below, so please be sure to update that. Okay, so we're gonna save our toolpaths, and here I will name this Avid CNC Tool Tray 0.25 down. I just like to put the name of the a router bit that I'll be using, zero material, just so I remember which surface I'm referencing. Um, if you update your post processor and update Mach 4, um, it will be a great way to set you up for making sure you uh, can read the header of your code, which will tell you uh, which router bits you'll be using and where your zero work offset is located. So save it into a folder that you can access on your control computer and save. So now we're ready to run our part and set up our machine. So let's go do that. Hi all, this is Sammy from Avid CNC and welcome to part two, where we are going to set up our machine, do some basic work holding, and then walk through the uh, whole process on how to cut our part and run our program. All right, let's go ahead and jump into it. Let's go ahead and turn on our CNC controller. I like to just put my hand right next to the fan here and that will let me know in a loud shop when the controller is turned on, something can get unplugged. So that's a really great way uh, to know that the controller is on without actually having to hear it. Okay, so now that my controller is on, I want to go ahead and open up Mach 4. So you always wanna make sure that your version of Mach 4 is up to date. Uh, go ahead and check out the link in the description below uh, to see if your Mach 4 is the most recent version. Um, as I mentioned earlier, make sure that your VCarve post processor is also up to date. All right, so now our controller is turned on and Mach 4 is open. Let's go ahead and enable our CNC controller. Great, so now that we've enabled, we can go ahead and use the arrow keys to move the gantry. And we just wanna confirm that we have uh, connectivity. I like to jog my machine farther up close to the front of the machine without getting too close to the sensors here. Uh, we have uh, several sensors here. This is the Benchop Pro machine, obviously. So we have the Y1, Y2. This is the X plus. On the other side is X minus. Um, if you have a Pro machine, you're going to find that your 
um, if you have a pro machine from the last year or year and a half, uh, there is only one X sensor which will go on the Z gantry here on the back and then detect the uh, X sensor flags there. We also have the Z axis sensor here and that uh, will detect this metal plate as well. So we're going to go ahead and home our CNC machine. This is the first thing you want to do when you turn on your machine at the beginning of each day. So it can really just figure out where it is in space and uh, find its repeatable uh, home coordinates so it can really uh, dial in the, that uh, repeatability. So let's go ahead and click on home XYZ. And here it will travel to the end of each axis. Awesome, so now we have homed our CNC machine. I can go ahead and jog my machine back and out of the way. Awesome, so uh, this is a tray that we have already cut. Um, here is the tool tray uh, that I'm upgrading from. This is just, you know, um, an old uh, scrap material I cut and uh, haven't really refined too much, but um, it's uh, certainly an upgrade. So I'm gonna move this out of the way. And I'll go ahead and clean off the spoil board of any uh, sawdust or anything that's in the way so our material will lay really flat. I'll go ahead and put on my PPE and make sure I am protected. I'll go ahead and grab our material and place it on our spoil board here. I'll line it up to uh, the V groove lines I have on my spoil board just so it's generally pretty square to my machine. This doesn't matter too much because I am cutting out the overall shape versus if I'm trying to do an engraving perfectly centered and squared to an object. In that case, I might be more precise about the placement of my material in relation to my spoil board, which is what these alignment holes are for. If those holes are drilled by the machine, then those holes are going to be square to the way that the machine moves. The important thing about that is that you'll just be able to bump up your material if you put some dowel pins um, in there, which makes it really easy and quick to set up. But for now, I'm not so concerned about that. Um, it's very close and we have a lot of wiggle room around the overall piece. So now I'm gonna go ahead and find my Omer nail gun. Uh, this is the work holding that I'm gonna be using today. Uh, this is a, a pneumatic nail gun that shoots composite nails. So these are essentially made of plastic. They are really fantastic because they, uh, really easy to use just like any pneumatic nail gun but the best thing is that because they're plastic if i accidentally cut through them it won't damage my router bit so i like to take my nails and hold them up against the edge of my material make sure that there's about a half an inch um, above and then i know this is going to be the right length for the material that i'm using i can go ahead and insert those nails, release that trigger, and we'll grab our air hose. Let's go ahead and hook up our air hose. Perfect, and we'll go ahead and place a few nails here in the corners of our material. Let's do one more. Perfect. And we can go ahead and give that what I call a wiggle test, just giving it a little shake to make sure that that's not going anywhere. Um, it's just really reassuring when you're selecting your material 
work holding solution. Uh, there is a series of pros and cons to consider what is the speed to set them up, the cost of the tool, the overall cost uh, to use it, how quick and easy it is to set up, and how easy it is to remove. So there's lots of uh, those things to consider as well as how trustworthy the work holding is going to be. Is it going to shift? Is there a potential for it to shift? Is there a potential for my router bit to hit a metal fastener and damage the router bit, which I have to replace later on? So do consider those things as well. All right, so now that we have our material set up onto the spoil board, let's go ahead and set our material zero, our work offset, to the front left and top corner of the material. So we're going to go ahead and remove our dust shoe here. And I already have a router bit installed. Uh, just make sure that that is tight and um, installed correctly, especially if you share a machine or you're working out of a maker space, that sort of thing. You want to ensure that if uh, someone before you left the tool in, that that is secure and working correctly. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and drive my spindle kind of towards the front. And I'll go ahead and place my touch plate here. Use the corner finding edge and place that on the corner like this. Okay, and I will go ahead and place the magnet on the router bit for best connectivity. Okay, put that out of the way. And I'll drive the spindle over so it's about centered and one inch above the brass plate. Okay, so we are centered. I can go ahead and open our Odyssey touch plate window. And here I will first enter in the tool diameter that is essential to the touch plate working correctly. We have a quarter inch bit. And here you can see there's this probe signal. Uh, which is black currently, but let's just double check that the connection will be made. So I can lift the touch plate up and touch the router bit and ensure that the probe signal is turning blue. So that looks good. We are making a full circuit, so that's good. Okay, so now we can select the picture that best matches the operation we're going to do. If you hover over the icons uh, for long enough, they will let you know exactly what axes or which axes are being probed. So we'll select the front left top corner of the material. If you like to do Z only, make sure to select the center icon. So once we click, it will go ahead and begin lowering to touch the brass plate, lift up, and now it will prompt us to orient the flutes to connect to contact the Y wall here. So we'll say okay. Super, so now we will rotate to contact the X wall. Awesome. So we have completed our zeroing operation here. So we can go ahead and remove our touch plate and place that out of the way. We can also uh, reinstall our dust shoe. Perfect. And close our window. So now at this point we can go ahead and load our G code. Uh, for the program that we just exported in vCarve.
So one thing I really do like about the vCarve post processor is the header here. So it's really simple to read. Let's just go ahead and click through this. So it says uh, the name of our file, the day and time it was created for average CNC machines, and which version of the post processor we used, the material size, which is very helpful to double check, right? The Z origin says, it says for the Z origin here is our material surface. Our XY origin is the bottom and front left corner. So we did zero to the front left and the material surface. So that's great to double check. It says the minimum and maximum extents of the program. So these are going to be essentially coordinates from our work offset. The home position here, zero, zero, and Z1, so it's lifted one inch above uh, the material as a starting point. And the safe Z height is one inch above the material surface. So uh, that's really great to confirm if there is anything uh, that might block the spindle from traveling across from one side to the other. We can go down and look into the different toolpaths here that we have programmed and then also the tools uh, that we programmed into the file. So num tool number one is the end mill, which is a quarter inch end mill. T1M6 here means that it is a tool change to tool one, uh, but we already have tool one in our spindle and uh, there is only one tool required, so we won't need to do a tool change operation. M7 just means to turn on Relay 1, which we won't be using, but if you're using a router, for example, in Relay 1, that will turn on your router. Um, if you're using a spindle and want to have an additional vac vacuum uh, set up in there, uh, dust collection, you can plug in your vacuum um, to the Relay 1, and M7 will turn that on. You can continue to click through here. And M3 here will turn on our spindle. And then it will go on to cut our tool paths here. Let's go back to the beginning. And another thing I like to do is in our display over here, if you want to adjust the display settings, you can go to this window on the right, open this up, and adjust the widths of those lines. So I am going to just change those to 50 just so you can see them really well. So here, the red crosshairs represent our center of our spindle. So we can jog the spindle around and make sure that the toolpaths that we programmed are going to be pretty much centered onto our material. And if the jog rate is a little too slow for you, you can go ahead and switch that to 100% jog rate rather than 50%. To double check, I just like to jog my spindle over to the farthest point on my toolpath preview window here to make sure that the toolpaths are going to be on the material and that just gets one last visual check that we're going to be uh, set up correctly and I can move forward. So from here, you can run the program with the spindle not at work uh, X, Y, work zero. But let's go ahead and click this button just so we can demonstrate. Make sure that your Z is lifted to a safe height. We're going to go ahead and click go to work X, Y, zero. The machine will move, the machine will move at a rapid rate. So just be prepared for that. We'll go ahead and click OK. Super, so we are at the X, Y, zero for our work coordinates. And let's just go ahead and go through our 10 step cycle start checklist and make sure that we are feeling very confident before we hit cycle start. 
So I've also linked the cycle start checklist in the description below. There's a video you can follow. Uh, I highly recommend printing out a copy and having that available, um, especially for the uh, beginning of your relationship with using the CNC machine. But checklists are really one of the best safety tools that we have. Even pilots use them every time they fly a plane or uh, whatever they're flying, I guess, these days. So uh, make sure to go through those checklists to really ensure you're not going to be making uh, a mistake that you wish you had avoided. It's, a lot of these mistakes are very simple and we all make them and that's okay, uh, but this is just going to help us prevent making them as often um, as we might if we didn't use this tool. I will locate the emergency stop, which I have mine mounted to the workbench, so I just want to ensure that that is easily available. I want to make sure I have home my CNC machine. We have done that. You can always go to your Mach 4 screen and ensure that these light up as green, and that will make sure you have not lost your zero reference points. We'll confirm our material dimensions. Um, this is a really great habit to get into. I can look in my G code here and check the material dimensions here. 24 by 8. I'll just go ahead and quickly measure here. 24 by 8 by 3 quarters. Um, I know that sounds like a silly mistake to make, but uh, we'll just confirm that those are correct. Um, sometimes your material is a little short or a little big. Um, you want to make sure your toolpaths are centered and exactly where you want them to be. We'll be sure to preview our toolpath programs and you will do that in vCarve uh, or in CAD CAM. Here we can also check up here in our preview window and ensure uh, that that is working well. You can jog your spindle over to make sure that that um, is exactly where you want the toolpath to go. We will check our work holding. It's firm and strong and we're confident in that. We will check that the tool is installed correctly and then that isn't going anywhere. Uh, we'll also double check our Z origin point. We use the touch plate to set to the front left and top corner. We've confirmed that in referencing our code here in the G code window. We'll ensure that we have the most recent version of our G-code loaded. Um, if you have done iterations or exported your code a couple different times, you do different tests, double check that you have the correct one loaded for that part. And then we'll just kind of review to make sure all these settings are looking good. Go ahead and turn on my VFD. You can also reach down and feel the air on your fan and make sure that the VFD has turned on. I will reinstall my dust shoe and then I will turn my dust collection on. Okay, so the last thing we want to do is make sure to test our spindle that will turn on. So let's go ahead and hit the spindle on off button. And I'll just listen. If I've already installed the dust shoe, I can listen and make sure I can hear it, that it turned on. If you don't have the dust shoe on, uh, make sure that it's completely stopped before you go ahead and install that dust shoe. Now that we have uh, ensured that we've gone through the whole 10 step cycle start checklist, let's go ahead and hit cycle start.
I'll go ahead and put some of my tools in the tool tray uh, while it's still mounted onto the spoil board just to ensure that everything fits um, and then I'm really happy with all of the sizes and dimensions um, of the different dishes and pockets. Uh, I'll go ahead and take those out and we'll remove the material from the spoil board. I'll go ahead and grab a mallet and just tap on the sides to remove the material from the spoil board. Tap out any extra dust. Um, if you have any favorite ways on how you like to remove CNC tabs, uh, let me know in the comments or in the chat. Uh, I am working on a 10 ways to remove and clean up your CNC tabs. Um, so if you have a favorite, let me know. I'd uh, love to hear it. And there you go. Here is the CNC tool tray, uh, all cut, completed. Uh, now I can go ahead and sand it, um, put some finish on, and put it to use. So after you're done uh, cutting your project and you're ready to shut your machine down for the day, I do want to remind you to close mock first and then turn the controller off. So let's go ahead and do that. And now, once I've closed Mach 4, let's go ahead and turn the controller off. Okay, great. So that's how you uh, set up and cut uh, this project on the CNC machine. I hope you enjoyed this process. And if you want to learn a new process or program, or if there's a project you have in mind uh, that you'd like us to demonstrate for you, let us know in the comments, and we'd be happy to add it to the project queue. Happy making everyone and I can't wait to see what we make. I'll see you in the shop.